what I want to be exploring is the power of the gospel, but in particular, why we may not be experiencing the power of the gospel sometimes. Uh, in my journey, sometimes it's felt like I've, I've understood the concept of the gospel, but then when I was looking at my experience of it, it was apparent that the power was lacking. And so what I really want to look into and tap into is, well, how can we gain access to the power of the gospel? Before we get into that, I just want to share a story of a, a man, Japanese man, Hiro Onoda. I probably butchered the pronunciation there. And our Hiro was a soldier trained up by the Japanese military and he served in World War II. He was trained up as a special operative to go in and essentially blow up enemy um, equipment, enemy bases. And he was sent to an island in the Philippines in 1945, Lubang Island. And he's sent there with, with his, um, his, his group, his platoon, with a special mission. But just before they carried out this mission to blow up a, a US army base, his commanding officers changed plans and they didn't end up carrying out the objective to blow up these bases. The US came in, took over the island and demolished the, the, the Japanese soldiers that were there to the point where it was just Hiro Onoda and a few of his comrades. And one by one, the Japanese soldiers were being killed. And eventually, Hiro finds himself as being the highest ranking officer. He's in charge of three others. This is all that's left of the Japanese soldiers in this area. And so they make the decision to head for the mountains. Eventually, Japan surrenders and the war is declared to be over. But Hiro and the three other soldiers didn't believe the news that they heard. They, they believed that these were formulated lies, propaganda from the enemy trying to get them to surrender. And he had been told, you will defend this island with your life. By any means necessary, you defend this island, even if it means your death. And he was committed to the cause. So they headed up into the mountains and they continued to fight this war that had been declared over. And they kept fighting for years and years. In 1950, one of their comrades was, was shot by a, a local patrol. The war's now been over for five years. These individuals are living up in the jungle. They're making themselves huts out of, of bamboo. They're living off fruit and the occasional stolen cow and they're fighting as if the war is still going. And one of them gets taken out by local authorities who are doing patrol. There's down to three. Several years later, I believe it was about 1954, another one of them is killed. He was out on a mission to burn something down. They were, they were just attacking different things around the area, such as burning crops, attacking local farmers, because the war is over, remember? But these guys are so committed to the cause they're refusing to believe the propaganda that was put out and they continue to fight. And another one of them gets shot and is killed. And so there's only two left. But in 1959, the Japanese government declared that these two soldiers, Hiro and his comrade, were dead. Little did they know, they were still in the jungle of the Philippines fighting a war that ended in 1945. After the the declaration from the Japanese government, these individuals were forgotten about until in 1972. Hiro's comrade was out on a mission and he was shot. 1972. It was after this that the, the, the Japanese media grabbed a hold of this story and they started putting out this, I guess, a, a bit of a story, a bit of an urban myth that perhaps Hiro was still alive. And he became somewhat of an urban and cult legend, this one Japanese soldier that refused to surrender. And in 1974, there was a young man who, I guess, became energised by this story and made a decision that he was going to find Hiro. And so, Noroi Suzuki heads off to the Philippines looking for Hiro. 
And somehow he finds him hanging out in the jungle. And somehow he convinced his hero not to kill him. And he tries to share the news with him that the war is over. But Hero says, I'm committed to the cause. I will not surrender unless my commanding officer, Mr. Tamaguchi, comes and gives me direct orders. Until then, I will not stand down. And so Suzuki heads back to Japan now with this mission of finding a commanding officer from 1945. Mind you, this is almost three decades later. 29 years later, like how is he going to find this guy? Is he even still alive? To, to, to put this into perspective, Hiro has now been fighting a war longer than the Beatles' music career. And this is a war that finished. Three decades. That's my lifetime. I'm only 32. And so Suzuki heads back to Japan. And somehow he tracks down the commanding officer, Tamaguchi, who is now working in a bookshop. And he explains the story to him. And he convinces Tamaguchi to head with him to the Philippines, to Lubang Island. Onada's brother goes with him and they, they go to try and convince Hiro Onada to surrender. And so they turn up. Tamaguchi has his, his, his uniform on and informs Hiro that the war is in fact over. And, and Hiro wrote in his book and recalled that he still thought it was a trap. And he was waiting for Tamaguchi to slip him a note to say, don't believe them, the war's still on. Eventually they convinced him. And after he accepted this news, Hiro passes out. He just blacks out. And all things considered, he probably took it pretty well. <laughs> For 29 years, this man fought a war that was over. For 29 years, he failed to live in the truth that he was no longer a soldier. He no longer had to attack and live this lifestyle of war. For 29 years, he missed out on being with family and friends. For 29 years, that's a lifetime. And when we, we talk about the gospel, a key idea is that the gospel is news and not advice. The gospel is news and not advice. Advice is that if you perform an action, you get a certain result. The gospel is news is that Jesus' life, death and resurrection has changed something, just as the declaration of war being over changes things. Good news, the war is over. Hero missed the good news. He thought they were lies. And because of that, it impacted how he lived his life. I responded to this good news when I was about 20 years old. I was baptised in March 2012. But after that experience, the initial experience, I moved into what I call the, the gospel of struggle. And Galatians chapter 3, verse 3, kind of references this a little bit. And it's worth us flicking there. So if you've got your Bible, we'll just quickly check out this verse in Galatians. Chapter 3, verse 3. Paul here says, Are you so foolish, having begun in the Spirit, are you now being perfected by the flesh? I recognised that as a follower of Christ, God was calling me to live in a certain way. And my, my, my emphasis became focused on my behaviour, on, on, on how I lived and how I acted. But I became discouraged because I failed to have victory over particular sinful actions in my life continually falling down. And I guess I entered into almost like a yo-yo experience where when I was living according to the way which I felt I should live, I felt like I was right with God. I mean, God were tight. But then if I made a mistake and I fell back in old patterns, I felt like I was disconnected from God. And there was this barrier and I couldn't, couldn't re-engage with that relationship until almost like a, a time period of, um, what, what's the word I'm looking for here? Penance, that's the word. Thank you, Kyle. This, this, this idea of penance, which is not gospel. 
And so essentially I was living this experience where Paul says, are you so foolish? Having begun by the Spirit, are you now being perfected by the flesh? Like having begun in grace, for by grace you have been saved through faith and that not of yourselves. Ephesians 2.8. We're saved by grace, it's a gift. And I recognise that, but in my mind, in my brokenness, in my misunderstanding, I thought I had to re- modify my behaviour in my own strength. And in my own strength, I continually fail. And so I was just moving in and out of this relationship with God. My experience lacked power. So what's God's resolution to this? Like where is the power of the gospel? How do I access the power that I read about? How do I access the power that I hear others speak about, that I, I witness in others these transformed lives? What's God's resolution to the problem? Now, before we get to God's resolution, we need to explore a little bit of humanity, the, 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 the human being. There's three parts to the human. For those of our young people, most likely, individuals who are at big camp and heard Edsel Cadet speak, this will be familiar to you. I came across this idea in a book by Jennifer Swertzer, who's a, a, a counsellor and theologian in America. And she shares this idea. Now, I'm going to need three volunteers. Um, so, Kyle and Joe, are you happy to be my volunteers? Yeah, that's two, and we need a third one. I'm just going to call Jake because I love his reaction. <laughs> I could see you looking the other way. <laughs> Thanks, Jake. Please come up, guys. Uh, a little clap for our volunteers. Thank you. All right. These three individuals are going to demonstrate one human being. So, one human being. You're three parts of one person. All right. So, Joe. No, no, I didn't tell you to do that, Kyle. Put your hands down. Yeah. We'll get to that. All right. We're going to need a bit of an arm's length between you as well. Yep, but not that much, like half a step closer. All right, well done. A clap for them. (laughs) Ah. Joe, you are the spirit. This is the spiritual element of the human being. The spirit is the the part of ourselves that wants to connect with the supernatural. This is the thing that makes us human. This is where our will and our conscious is seated, where our faith is. This is the spirit. All right. Kyle, you're our mind. So the mind is where we have our thoughts, our beliefs, our imagination. This is how we make sense of the world. Kyle is the mind. And Jake? The body. (laughs) Jake is the body. This is where, well, it's pretty obvious here, right? Our body. This is where we live out our, our, our desires, our experiences, our inclinations, the physical element. Jake is the body. Now, when we were designed by God, we were perfectly connected, our spirit connecting to the spirit, God, right? The deepest part of our being connected with God in a perfect relationship. And then our spirit, are you happy putting your hand on Kyle's shoulder? Our spirit would then inform our mind as to how to make sense of reality. (laughs) What did I miss? (laughs) Oh, okay, yeah, yeah, I like that, I like that. Right. So the spirit is informing the mind how to make sense of reality, our beliefs, how to think about what's going on around us. And then the mind would inform the body. So Kyle, your hand on Jake's shoulder there. The mind would inform the body then how to live that out in your surrounds. So what this tells us is that the spiritual element is what's governing the rest of the human. Are you guys following this? So the spiritual side is what governs how we act, how we decide to put our desires into behaviour. But what happened at the fall of humanity is that the spiritual element was severed. Severed from God and then severed from our mind. And there was a severing from the body. And what happens here when we fall, we try to start making sense of our condition. And so the mind starts telling the spirit what's going on. So Kyle... You start informing the spirit. Because each of us experiences woundedness and brokenness. And we're trying to make sense of that around us. And so we start telling ourselves a story. This is why that happened. This is why you're in this condition. So we have like this narrative to make sense of reality. And then the body 
is informing the mind. And the mind experiencing pain needs to be numbed. And so the body, we can self-medicate our pain through our actions. And so then we're, we're driven by our desires and our drives. So the original creation has been inverted. Are you guys seeing that? So originally we're designed where we're spiritual beings connected to the vine, divine, and that informs how we live our lives. The fall inverted this and now our physical being is now telling our mind and our spirit how to operate. We're tracking with this so far. All right, you guys have nailed it. Well done. Yep, you can go now. Thank you to our volunteers. Appreciate it. So now we find ourselves in this circumstance where maybe you can relate to this, where you find your body driving what's happening in the other parts of your being. And so going back to my experience where I recognise God is calling me to live in a certain way, but then within my body I'm having these desires that I feel powerless to do anything about. And then I'm also carrying in my mind these wounds from my experiences in life that maybe there's something wrong with me that I'm not lovable. That's why those certain individuals hurt me. And so I numb my mind with my body through different approaches and actions. An easy way to do this is substances, self-medicating, or through TV or social media, or even through success and positive things. And then my mind is trying to navigate what's happening in the spirit. So what we need then is a solution, something to reorient us back towards our original design. The solution that God provides for us is to relaunch humanity. God's focus is not always where our focus is. Jesus' focus is not always where our focus is. As an individual, my focus so much, so often falls on the body, what's happening in the body, so my behaviour, the external. But then when I look in the Gospels and how Jesus interacts with others, this is not where he's focusing. He's focusing on the spiritual. He's focusing on the heart. And we see this as an example in John chapter 4, the woman at the well. This is a lady. For those of you who know the story, you might be connecting the dots already, but for those of you who haven't heard the story, there's a lady in, that Jesus encounters a lady carrying many emotional wounds. She has, has had five husbands, five failed marriages. Imagine the emotional baggage an individual carries who's had five failed husbands, five failed marriages. And the guy that she's living with now won't even respect her enough to marry her. Can you imagine the emotional baggage she's carrying? the wounds and the trauma. And from a behavioural perspective, externally, like, you could look at this lady and go, like, what is wrong with you? Like, maybe get your life together. If you just did these things, then maybe men wouldn't leave you. But Jesus' focus is not where our focus is. Because this is symptomatic of a deeper problem, right? She's living out her woundedness. She's self-medicating through relationships. She experienced a wound in her spirit and then has told herself a story about that wound that perhaps I can fix myself through my body, through relationships. And then she's attempted to do that and that's just left her even more wounded. And society shunned her to the extent that she felt more comfortable going to the well in the middle of the day when the sun is blaring down than she did going with the other women. But Jesus' focus was not here. Jesus' focus was on the spirit. He wants to reinstate our original design. And he says to her, give me a drink. There's a, a reasonable request. You're in the desert, it's hot. But she calls him out because Jews 
didn't ask Samaritan women for drinks, nor did men speak to women in public. Jesus is breaking the taboos, but he's engaging her in this conversation. He says, if you knew who I am and what I can do for you, you'd ask me for a drink and I'd give you living waters. He said, if you knew who I was, you'd be asking me to solve that thirst that you have in your heart. She perceived that there was something about him, that perhaps he was a prophet, and he starts hitting right into the core of it. And he reveals to her that he knows her past, he knows her woundedness, but his focus isn't there. His focus is on non-condemning love. The path to healing and wholeness has to go through the garden of non-condemning love. And Jesus is demonstrating to her that he accepts her where she is and he has a solution and it's him. The relaunching of humanity. If we can be reconciled in our spirit to God and have an accurate picture of who we are according to him, then in our mind we can make sense of reality. We can operate according to the truth of the circumstance. And when we can operate according to the to truth, we start living that out in our body. So often now our approach is the opposite, where we focus on the external first, trying to fix this. But it's like putting a band-aid when you're missing an arm. It's not going to do anything. Like what we need is life-saving surgery. What we need is to be a part of this new humanity. This idea that, that Edsel shared, I love this line, and if you're going to take anything from this this morning, this is the hook, this is the key idea. There is no true abstinence without sustenance. There is no true abstinence without sustenance. And what that means is it's not possible to abstain in our bodies from these destructive behaviours unless we are sustained in our spirit with the Creator. It is impossible. We're, we're in a condition where we can't solve the problem ourselves. Our relationship has been severed from the divine. We're born into this as descendants of the first Adam and we're helpless, we're powerless. Paul talks about, about us as being found as enemies of God, weak sinners. Through no fault of our own, we're born in this condition. But then through our choices, we deepen that. We need a saviour. And so Jesus doesn't focus here where we so often focus on the behaviour. He's saying, you need to be born again. He's saying, you need the water that I have. Because there's no abstinence. You can't abstain. You can't live right unless you're sustained. Unless you have true sustenance. When I ask myself that question, why am I not seeing the power of the gospel in my life? The answer is quite often it's when I'm believing lies or failing to believe the truth. Hiro Onada could have gone home in 1945, but for 29 years he fought a war that was over. I heard about the gospel 2011. Well, that's when I, I started pursuing God. I was, I was fortunate enough to be introduced to the gospel as a kid. But I started grasping it more clearly as a 20-year-old. But for 10 years, I was fighting a war that wasn't mine to fight. And what I mean by that is Victory over sin in our life is not in struggle, but in surrender. Victory over sin in our lives is not in struggle, but in surrender. Surrendering to our Creator, surrendering to the victory we already have in Christ, the accomplished fact. Faith doesn't manufacture ideas to believe in. 
Faith is acknowledging what's already true in Christ. That's faith. And if I'm not seeing the fruits of the gospel in my life, it's because I'm failing to live by faith. I'm failing to live by the truth that is already reality in Christ. There's a, there's a story in, in Luke chapter 5 where a centurion, a Roman soldier, calls for Jesus to come and heal his servant. He sends some servants to Jesus and they say, our master is a good man and he's good for the Jewish people. His servant is sick, please come and heal him. They're trying to merit this favour from Christ, saying he's a good man, he deserves you to do this. And then the next day, someone else comes and says, this is a message from the centurion, recognising that he was a man of authority and that's why the centurion didn't come himself. And the centurion recognised that all Jesus had to do was speak the word and the servant would be healed. And Jesus marvels at this because he says, in all of Jerusalem, in all of Israel, he hadn't seen faith like the centurions. And I used to wonder, like, so what is the faith that he has? The centurion recognised that whatever God spoke became reality. The centurion recognised Jesus as God incarnate in human flesh. Whatever he spoke was truth to the extent that if Christ was here with us today and he said to me Josh that's a lovely green jacket you have on it would become green because what he speaks becomes reality and so when the centurion approaches Christ he says I recognize all you got to do is speak the word and he'll be made well that's faith Jesus has spoken the word because of what Christ has done for us because of his life, death and resurrection. Paul says we can reconcile, we can consider ourselves dead to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus. Now it's probably really important that we define what sin is here. And we could do a whole, probably a whole sermon just on that one idea. We'll give you a, a brief definition. Because I think if we misunderstand sin, we misunderstand the solution. Hey, many of you are probably thinking of the verse in 1 John that sin is transgression of the law. Well, what is the law? Paul tells us law is love. Law is functioning according to design, right? Spirit, mind, body. Sin is not only actions. Sin is to be in a state of rebellion against your creator. Severed in the spirit. And so as humans, we're born into sin. We're born disconnected from God. And when we're born into this state, it impacts us in our body. And so we commit actions of sin. So you could almost say that there's sin, the capital sin, which is disconnection from God, so broken relationship and rebellion against God, that leads to the actions of sin. And because this is symptomatic of a deeper problem, this is not God's focus, nor should it be ours. The gospel is not behavioural reformation. The gospel is not try your hardest with an extra boost from Jesus each day. The gospel is a message. The gospel is news that because of what Christ has done, we are dead to the state of rebellion now if you are in fact in Christ Jesus. And if you're in Jesus, that gives you the truth about who you are, the truth about your value, your identity, and therefore you're empowered to live according to design in your body and you can love like God loves. That's the power of the gospel. And so if I'm not seeing transformation here, don't despair, focus on the solution. My experience has been that the closer I draw to God, the more I see my wretchedness. Because comparatively, Jesus' perfect other-centred character where he puts others above and before himself always, and when I compare that with myself, I fall short. And so the more clearly I see him, the more clearly I see myself. And I'm tempted to despair and go like, woe is me, wretched man that I am. 
But the call from God is to keep our eyes focused on Christ. By beholding, we become changed. So while I recognize my condition, that's not going to be my focus. My focus is on Jesus. My focus is on the cross. My focus is on the fact that I am dead to sin, but alive to God. I'm going to live in faith. I'm going to claim those promises that what Jesus spoke becomes reality. Romans 12, 2. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, by the renewing of your beliefs, by the renewing of your understanding of the world around you. Transformation happens in your head. We access that by faith. I want to share a practical step with you guys called faith statements. Uh, a friend of mine, we call this practicing gospel. And this is instead of moving into struggle and going, Lord, help me to be strong enough to overcome such and such. It's moving into belief and going, Lord, I thank you that because of what Christ has done for me and in me, I am dead to sin. And that I am your workmanship, your poem created in Christ Jesus for good works and today I'm going to walk in it. That's a faith statement, not a struggle statement. A faith statement claims the reality of what's already in Christ. It's resting on the accomplished fact. So if you're not seeing the power of the gospel in your life, my challenge to you is start claiming it, start practicing gospel. Paul talks about this in Romans chapter 1, verse 12, where he recognises that he will experience mutual benefits by sharing the gospel with those in Rome. So Paul's going to go and share the good news with others and he's going to benefit from it. Proverbs also talks about this, that he who waters is also watered himself. And so what I have taken from this is that we should be daily getting together either over the phone or in person and encouraging one another with faith statements. Practicing the truth. Transforming our mind. Neuroplasticity, right? Forging new neural pathways, new ways of thinking. Claiming those promises. Speaking the word over one another. For by grace, each and every one of us has been saved. Through faith. It is a gift of God. None of us can boast about it. I am dead to sin but alive to God in Christ Jesus. His death on the cross was my death. Therefore, I am free. I'm praising God for that. This is what it means to practice gospel. We've talked before earlier this year about habits. First you shape your habits and then your habits shape you, right? Imagine if each one of us had that habit of practicing gospel, the habit of faith statements, the habit of walking in the truth. I don't know what message God's putting on your heart this morning. I don't know where you're presently at in your relationship with God. I know God's moving on hearts this morning. I just want to challenge you guys to look for something that you can apply. And the application might be seeking more information. It might be exploring more about this good news, this accomplished fact. The application might be changing your approach and changing your prayers from a prayer of help me be stronger, God, to thank you that I'm already victorious in you, Father. It might be a decision to find someone else to practice the gospel with this week. I don't know what it is, but I'm challenging you guys not to leave it here. Make a decision to move forward with something new, a new approach to apply something you've heard. If you'd like to talk more about it, I'm always up for practicing gospel. I'm in the blessed position where I get to do this throughout the week. And it's almost like I'm, I'm cheating sometimes because I get to practice more often. And I really hope, I hope and pray that you guys have got even the slightest blessing of what I've, I've been able to get from God. And then we're kicking goals. Because when we start applying the good news to our lives, it's a game changer. 
It's completely transformational. That, that idea in Romans 12, this is my last point, Romans 12 too, that we would be transformed by the renewing of our minds. The Greek word there, metamorphosis. It's the caterpillar becoming the butterfly. That's a radical transformation. And it comes from believing the truth. When we go back to Hero's story, it's a pretty radical difference to go from living in the jungle in the Philippines to then living back in Japan. And the thing that allowed him to do that was accessing the truth that the war was over. And while the war is not over in our circumstance, we're in the midst of a spiritual war, we stand on the, on, on, on the victory of Christ. The war has been won. And we look forward to the blessed hope when Jesus will come again and take us to be with him, when he will recreate everything. But in the meantime, while we're waiting for that, we're not to sit idle. We're not to struggle. We're to move into belief and to practice gospel with one another. That's my hope and prayer for our church, that we would be a church that is actively practicing gospel daily.